Natasha Alex Carter was born on December 22, 1989, to mother Susan Gale Carter. Known to her loved ones by her middle name, Alex, her life was marked by a complex family history that would be tragically altered on August 8, 2000, when she mysteriously vanished alongside her 41-year-old mother, Susan. Born into a world marked by impending turmoil and uncertainty, Natasha's formative years were overshadowed by the tumultuous custody battle between her parents, Ricky Lafferty and Susan Gale Carter. The couple's relationship was marred by discord, exacerbated by Susan's bipolar diagnosis, for which she declined medication. However, the relationship reached its breaking point when Susan was found in the company of other men, eventually establishing a romantic connection with the couple's landlord, Larry Dell Webb. In 1998, Susan and Larry decided to get married, and thanks to Larry's influential connections, Susan managed to secure custody of Natasha, despite her ongoing mental health challenges. What followed was a contentious and heated legal dispute between Susan and Ricky over the custody of their daughter, Natasha. The custody battle took a darker turn when, during a mediation meeting, Susan allegedly made ominous threats to Ricky Lafferty, promising that he would never see Natasha again. Susan failed to appear for the next hearing, and custody was granted to Ricky. On August 8, 2000, the course of Susan and Natasha's lives took an inexplicable turn when they vanished without leaving a trace. Natasha, who was a mere 10 years old at the time, had not been in contact with her father Ricky for several months leading up to her disappearance. When Ricky grew increasingly concerned and decided to reach out to Larry, Susan's new husband, to inquire about his daughter's whereabouts, he was met with a perplexing response. Larry, in his initial response, claimed that Susan and Natasha had left in the company of a man named Jose with the assurance that they would return shortly. However, just a few days later, Ricky made another anxious call to Larry, only to be told a different story. This time, Larry stated that Susan and Natasha had left with a man named Manuel. The ever-changing names of the individuals added another layer of confusion to the mystery. Given Susan's remarks about making sure Ricky never sees his daughter again, investigators suspected that Susan had kidnapped Natasha herself. This suspicion was validated by Natasha's grandmother, who believed that she was afraid of her mother and did not want to live with her. In the wake of their disappearance, a felony warrant was issued for Susan Gale Carter on November 13, 2000 charging her with the kidnapping. The initial narrative categorized Natasha as the victim of a family abduction, speculating that she might be in the company of her mother and an adult male. There were also concerns that they might have crossed state lines, compounding the challenge of locating them. Over the years, the case has remained shrouded in mystery, with no concrete leads or significant breakthroughs. Natasha's father, Ricky Lafferty, continued to hold on to hope that he would one day be reunited with his daughter. Despite the passage of two decades, the case was far from being forgotten or deemed unsolvable. Though the case received very little media attention, authorities remained committed to finding answers and ensuring justice for Natasha and her family. In 2021, the FBI elevated the reward offered for vital information that could potentially unveil the whereabouts of either Natasha or her mother Susan. That same year, law enforcement authorities revealed that Susan might also be operating under the alias Susan Gale Carter Webb. But with no progress in the case, 
investigators began to look at the possibility that what they once believed was a family abduction could have been a case of foul play. Susan Gale Carter, who was the prime suspect in Natasha's disappearance, was no longer the focus of the investigation. West Virginia State Police uncovered new evidence that indicated both Susan and Natasha mysteriously disappeared simultaneously. In a statement, West Virginia State Police said, This case was originally reported as Susan Carter kidnapping Natasha Carter. But over the course of this investigation, it has been determined that both Susan Carter and Natasha Carter are and have been missing since August 8, 2000. This revelation reshaped the entire narrative surrounding their disappearance. There was an unexpected twist in the case when West Virginia police zeroed in on Larry Dell Webb's residence, 100 block of Kyle Lane, where Susan and Natasha were living during the time of their disappearances. In August 2023, the FBI initiated a thorough search of the property with the aim of uncovering evidence related to Natasha and Susan's disappearances. Webb, who is now in his 80s, claimed to suffer from dementia and memory loss. During a press conference held at the time of the FBI's inquiry, Webb appeared bewildered by the sudden intrusion into his home. He claimed to have no understanding as to why the authorities were combing through his property. However, when the name Natasha was mentioned, he did acknowledge some degree of familiarity. And when Susan was brought up, he expressed that he believed they were married. In a rather fragmented recollection, he also mentioned that he was away on a trip when the mother and daughter mysteriously disappeared. The FBI search yielded an unexpected discovery, as reported by Webb's live-in caretaker, Terry Lilly. It was stated that law enforcement found a bullet in the wall of the bedroom, allegedly with Natasha's DNA on it, though that has yet to be confirmed. Authorities also removed tiles from the basement floor. In October 2023, Larry Dell Webb was charged with taking Natasha's life in the first degree. This marked a significant breakthrough in the case. It is worth noting that Webb has not been charged in connection with Susan's disappearance, leaving that part of the mystery unresolved. Despite these developments, the fact remains that both Natasha and Susan continue to be missing leaving an air of uncertainty surrounding their ultimate fate. The investigation remains active, and Webb is awaiting trial. Natalie Cochran, a licensed pharmacist, originally hails from West Virginia, a state known for its stunning natural beauty and tight-knit communities. She carved a place for herself there, living a seemingly ordinary life with her husband, Michael Cochran. Natalie and Michael seem to be enjoying a life of tranquility, but that peaceful existence was abruptly shattered when Michael suddenly and mysteriously passed away on February 11, 2019. Later that same year, Natalie was thrust into the spotlight due to the unraveling of a Ponzi scheme and mounting allegations that suggested her involvement in her husband's demise might be deeper and more sinister than initially believed. In July 2019, federal prosecutors filed a civil lawsuit against Natalie Cochran, alleging that she and her late husband, Michael, operated a financial scam. The Cochrans were the owners of two companies, Tactical Solutions Group and Technological Management Studios. They purportedly led investors to believe that Tactical held government contracts to supply semi-automatic weapons to various defense agencies, including the U.S. Department of Defense. 
These allegations mark the start of a complex legal saga. According to the civil lawsuit, the Cochranes deceived investors by making them believe in the legitimacy of their government contracts. In total, both companies raised at least $2.5 million from 11 investors. Investors were promised significant returns on their investments, but the truth was vastly different. U.S. Attorney Mike Stewart revealed that Tactical did not possess any government contracts for semi-automatic weapons. Instead, the Cochrans allegedly spent investors' money on lavish living, expensive dining, and other personal expenses. Tactical made donations to various local organizations, including Shady Spring Middle School's football department and the Shady Spring Youth Baseball League. They also donated semi-automatic weapons as bingo prizes at a fundraiser held at Shady Spring High School. This fundraiser raised over $32,000, with half of the proceeds going to Shady Spring High Volleyball and the other half to the Shady Spring Youth Baseball League, for which Natalie served as treasurer. Despite the significant donations, questions began to emerge about the legitimacy of the funds. The league board member, James Quesenberry revealed that Tactical's check for $16,680 bounced, and numerous unauthorized withdrawals were made from the league account. An internal audit was conducted to investigate financial records. As the legal scrutiny intensified, Natalie filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy in July. Her bankruptcy filings revealed that she had minimal income and assets. She claimed to have less than $600 in bank accounts and a staggering $1.4 million in liabilities. The allegations against the Cochrans prompted federal and state investigations into their business dealings. It was reported that investors received letters on a U.S. Department of Defense letterhead assuring them that their returns on investment would be available at a later date. Natalie maintained that much of the information related to the investments was classified and could not be discussed. Natalie claimed in a creditor's meeting that federal agents and West Virginia State Police had frozen her bank accounts, rendering her unable to pay her creditors. On February 11, 2019, Natalie's husband and business partner, Michael Cochran, passed away at Bowers Hospice House, five days after supposedly hitting his head during a seizure. The circumstances surrounding Michael's end prompted authorities to investigate further. Reports emerged that Michael had been hospitalized multiple times in the months preceding due to an unspecified illness. A government official in Raleigh County disclosed that West Virginia State Police were looking into the case. In a startling development, a judicial order was executed in early September, leading to the exhumation of Michael Cochran's body from Sunset Memorial Gardens. The copy of the judicial order was reportedly sealed, pending the close of both federal and state investigations into the circumstances surrounding his tragic fate. Natalie maintained that her husband's passing was a result of an accidental fall that caused him to hit his head during a seizure. She asserted that Michael was transported to the hospital 20 minutes after his fall, and denied any involvement in what had happened to him. However, there were conflicting reports regarding the timeline of events and the presence of other adults in the house during the critical hours preceding Michael's hospitalization. In November 2021, Natalie found herself facing a first-degree charge for taking the life of her husband. By then, Natalie was already serving an 11-year federal prison sentence related to the Ponzi scheme.
which further fueled speculation about her involvement in Michael's end. The proceedings took an unexpected turn during a hearing in a Raleigh County courtroom. Natalie appeared in the courtroom wearing a brown skirt, khaki-colored pants, and shackles on her hands. Members of her family, including her two teenage children, were present. In a surprising move, the prosecution decided to drop the charge against Natalie. The reason cited was the need for more time to gather evidence. The prosecution's decision was a strategic one, aimed at allowing for a re-examination of Michael's body. Raleigh County Prosecuting Attorney Ben Hatfield made the motion to dismiss the charge, stating how vital the re-examining of the body would be to the case. Hatfield further clarified that he had consulted Michael's family before formally requesting the exhumation. The decision to re-exhume the body was not taken lightly, as Hatfield sought an expert's opinion to ensure that the examination would yield viable scientific evidence. Hatfield's request was rooted in the need for a specialized test that could detect insulin levels in tissue samples. This test had not been conducted during the initial autopsy, which took place when Michael's body was first exhumed in September 2019. The absence of this specific test left room for uncertainty. According to Hatfield, it was extremely likely that he would re-indict Natalie for the slaying of her husband once the examination was complete. Natalie's defense attorneys did not object to the prosecution's motions, which raised curiosity about their strategy. Matthew Victor, one of Cochrane's attorneys, revealed that this move would provide them with an opportunity to gather more evidence from the federal investigation. Their aim was to prove that Michael was aware of the Ponzi scheme, a revelation that, if true, could significantly impact the state's case. Despite the charge being dropped, Natalie still had several more years to serve in her federal sentence. This fact weighed into the decision to dismiss the charge. The goal was to conduct the necessary tests and gather more evidence while she served her federal sentence. Following the hearing, as she was escorted out of the courtroom by police, Natalie had a brief moment to speak with her family. In a poignant exchange, she expressed her love and bid farewell to her children. The parents of Michael Cochran were also present during the hearing. The latest development in the case of Natalie Cochran happened on October 24, 2023, when Raleigh County Prosecuting Attorney Ben Hatfield announced that a special grand jury had re-indicted Natalie and charged her with taking Michael's life. After the body was exhumed, a renowned forensic pathologist from Texas confirmed that someone had taken Michael's life, attributing it to the unprescribed exogenous insulin in Michael's system. Due to the special grand jury session being so late in its term, it is expected that Natalie Cochran will go to trial in 2024, where it is expected that she will be found guilty of all the charges against her. In the 1990s, Huntsville, Arkansas was a small, close-knit rural town situated in the Ozark Mountains of northwestern Arkansas. The town's character was deeply rooted in its historical and agricultural traditions, and it was a place where community bonds were strong and life moved at a slower pace compared to larger urban areas. The community life in Huntsville during the 1990s was marked by the strong sense of togetherness. Residents often knew each other well, and the town's social fabric was woven through various community events. Huntsville was a place where locals looked forward to annual fairs, parades, and local festivals. 
These gatherings not only provided entertainment, but also served as opportunities for people to come together and strengthen their community bonds. It is against this rural backdrop that the tragic case of Sabrina Underwood unfolded. Sabrina Underwood, a 19-year-old at the time, disappeared on January 20, 1991, after her mother dropped her off at the U.S. Highway 412 and 62 near Bear Creek in Boone County. Sabrina was on her way to Calico Rock to visit her boyfriend, who was incarcerated at the time. Sabrina's mother never saw her again, and Sabrina's disappearance sent shockwaves through the community. Months of anxious waiting followed Sabrina's disappearance. Then, on April 8, 1991, the town was rocked by a grim discovery. A hunter stumbled upon human bones, hair, a pair of panties, and an earring stud near the Gum Spring Cemetery northwest of Little Rock. The remains were identified as those of Sabrina Underwood, her fate far from the destination she had hoped to reach. Sabrina's demise was initially classified as undetermined at the time, marking the beginning of a painstaking and heart-wrenching investigation. Law enforcement officials worked tirelessly, conducting interviews, exploring leads, and attempting to unravel the circumstances surrounding her case. Despite their dedicated efforts, no arrests were made, and the case eventually went cold, casting a shadow of unsolved mystery over Huntsville for years to come. It would take more than three decades for the darkness to recede. In July 2022, a pivotal tip emerged, reigniting the investigation. A local attorney with a client incarcerated at an Arkansas state prison possessed a confession letter that was both shocking and chilling. The client, Rick Allen Headley, was already serving a life sentence for the 2018 slaying of his estranged wife, Kirsty Headley. The confession letter contained graphic details of Sabrina Underwood's brutal end, breathing new life into the long dormant case. Detectives wasted no time in interviewing Rick Allen Headley about the contents of the confession letter. The chilling details he provided would shed light on the brutal crime that had remained shrouded in mystery for more than 30 years. Headley admitted to the crime, and his confession read like a nightmarish scenario that had unfolded in the quiet town of Huntsville. According to the affidavit, Headley's confession painted a grim picture of Sabrina's final hours. He claimed that Sabrina approached him at a gas station and requested a ride. What transpired during that ride would go on to haunt Headley for years to come. In an astonishing turn of events, Sabrina made advances and shockingly demanded money, threatening to accuse Headley of harming her if he did not comply. Headley recounted the moments that would lead to Sabrina's brutal demise in a chilling narrative. After the intimate encounter in his truck, Sabrina informed him that she needed a significant sum of money or she would reveal that he had harmed her. This revelation shocked Headley, and he sensed that there was going to be problems. The events that followed were nothing short of horrifying. Headley decided to drive away, leaving Sabrina behind, but the gravity of the situation weighed heavily on him. He believed that he could not let her ruin his life. It was at this point that he launched a violent attack on her outside the truck. In a shocking and gruesome act, he dragged her into a small cemetery, hidden from the prying eyes of any passerby. The description of the slaying itself is nothing short of chilling. Headley confessed to using a Rambo-style knife, complete with a compass at the end, to cut through Sabrina's neck. 
He described in graphic detail how he used a rock to hammer on the knife blade until it broke the bone and severed her head from her body. His intention, he admitted, was to eliminate any chance that Sabrina could ever reveal what had happened to her. Following this horrifying act, Headley covered Sabrina's body with sticks and leaves to hide it from view. He then gathered her belongings and placed them near her remains. The knife and rock used in the gruesome crime were disposed of several miles away, thrown into a patch of woods. At his apartment in Mountain Home, Headley removed his blood-stained clothes, placed them in a trash bag, and took a shower to cleanse himself of Sabrina's blood. The trash bag containing his clothes was discarded in a dumpster behind a mall, after which Headley left the area. Headley's confession not only sent shockwaves through Huntsville, but also brought a measure of hope and closure to Sabrina's family, who had endured decades of pain and uncertainty. The arrest of Rick Allen Headley marks a long-awaited milestone in the quest for justice in the cold case of Sabrina Lynn Underwood. He now faces charges in connection with Sabrina's case and his upcoming court appearance in Fulton County Circuit Court in late November 2023 is awaited with bated breath by the community. The case serves as a stark reminder of the enduring dedication of law enforcement and the indomitable spirit of small-town communities who will never give up on finding justice for families like the Underwoods.